Revelation 13. As we look at chapter 13, and I've titled this The Two Beasts because it's about two beasts. That's real simple as we walk through. But um, the time frame for Revelation 13, if you get a picture of it, it, it probably is, uh, began back in the 600s uh, and then worked its way up to today. And then in the tribulation time, as we look at it, as we get to the end of chapter 13, it's going to be about halfway through or three quarters of a way through the great tribulation period that's there. But the picture uh, is of two beasts that come up from the sea. Um, and, and we'll see what they, what they are and what, what they represent. Um, so we're going to look at the first beast. And the first beast represents a kingdom. Though he's going to be portrayed as a man. And the second beast is a man who becomes a beast. So when a kingdom becomes a beast, the word beast here uh, is an, an entity of power. It, it represents a kingdom. It implies preparing destruction for men, meaning a slaughtering of men to oppose God. God is going to allow a kingdom to be raised up that's going to be represented by a man. And this kingdom will have authority to kill men. And its whole goal is to oppose God for the slaughter of men, making ready through subversion the slaughtering of men to oppose God using any means available. Again, this first kingdom that we're going to look at, this beast, uh, will represent will resemble a man, but he's going to represent a kingdom. This, this will be the Antichrist. He will be the political Antichrist. He's going to come upon the scene in a political arena, and, and he's going to work globally in that sense. Now, the second beast is when a man becomes a beast. And this time, the word beast in the second part of what it is, it means a brutal inner nature covered by a glorious religious facade. The second beast will be a man who will, who will have a brutal inner nature, but he'll be covered with a glorious religious facade. It means that this one will, will, by lying signs and wonders, play with fire to take the whole world into deception. It's going to lie like crazy. He will oppose God by imitating God so as to destroy men. This is the false prophet. He's the religious Antichrist. So we're going to, Antichrist, really simple. Anti means in place of, pseudo, false, in Christ. So in place of Christ, someone's going to try to put themselves instead of Christ and call themselves Christ in that, in that realm. So you're going to have a kingdom that becomes a beast and a man that becomes a beast. I'm going to read the first 10 verses and then we'll walk through chapter 13. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having 10 horns and seven heads. And on his horns were 10 diadems. And on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? And there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Verse 7. And it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and have authority over them. Every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, Everyone whose name was not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life, the life of the Lamb, 
who had been slain. If anyone has ears, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the preservation, the, the preservation of the faith of the saints. So this is the first beast. So what John sees here is, first of all, you have verse 1. The dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And if you back up to chapter 12, to verse 17, we looked last week, uh, the week before last, at the woman, the dragon, and the child. It says, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ. We saw that the dragon's whole goal after Christ rose from the dead was to attack the Jews and to attack the Christians. He's going to do that for the rest of time on this earth that, that he's allotted here. And it says the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And the implication is a real strong one. Think of uh, standing on the brim of the nations. That's what he's talking about. The dragon, the, it, it represents Satan. And the, the sea, the sand of the seashore represents the brim. And the sea itself represents the nations of the world. So what Satan did, as soon as Christ rose from the dead, as he positioned himself as on the brim of the nations of the world. And he began to take the leaders of the nations of the world and direct them toward, towards his order. And as he's been doing that for, for quite some time, um, from the nations, from the sea, it says, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns, seven heads. You know, he, he walks through that. So what John sees here is a beast rising up out of the sea. This, the sea, again, represents the nations of the world. And in this beast is the Antichrist as he comes up in place of Christ instead of Christ. And he's saying he resembles a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion. And what they all show is the late great empires of the world and that the beast would have all the powers of those empires. You have the empire of all the empires of the world. The beast would have the authority of all those empires. That's what he's showing here. So the beast represents what Daniel talks about is the authority of a revived Roman Empire. And we know today the Roman Empire has been revived because it's alive in every capital on earth. Every single capital building on earth represents the revived Roman Empire. They have the pylons, they have a dome, they have everything that represents that. Um, so he has incorporated this Antichrist, this, this kingdom that becomes a beast, will have the authority of the revived Roman Empire in its whole in, incorporation with all the ancient empires of the world. So it's going to get its power and authority from the dragon, that's Satan. So this Rome, revived Roman Empire will have an authority behind it, of all the empires of the world, because its power comes directly from Satan. And what will happen is, over time, especially in the day we live in today, the world will be astonished at this beast, because one of its empires seems to be destroyed or killed, and then it comes back to life in the eyes of the whole world. It makes a, a reappearance on world history. And the world becomes dumbfounded and overwhelmed by the deception this beast gives. And they're taken captive by its power and authority. And because this beast resembles a man, he will be to the world a great father figure. To all who have been deceived by him, he will be a great father figure. He will be loved by all as the great helper and restorer of global order. And if you know anything about what's about to happen to the church and the rapture of the church and the taking of, of the church away from the earth, it's going to cause chaotic global order. And this false prophet, this antichrist, this beast that represents a kingdom, the first thing he's going to do is unite the world globally. And he will become the father figure of global world order. In verse 5 and 6 here, it says that um, 
It was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and to act for 42 months. And he blasphemed against God and blasphemed his name and his tabernacle. Blaspheme here doesn't refer to cursing or swearing. Blaspheming here implies claiming God-like power or claiming oneself to be God. When Jesus stood before the Pharisees and they blamed him for blasphemy, he didn't curse God. He proclaimed to be the Son of God. He said, I am the Father, our one. And they said, blasphemy. How can you make yourself out to be God? And that's what this Antichrist is going to do. Pr pr present himself as God. John also tells us that the beast will also blaspheme God's name and God's tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. And what that means is the beast will have the authority of the revived Roman Empire and then he will proclaim to be speaking as God's spokesperson on earth. He will claim that his temple is God's temple and that his authority is God's authority. And those who are living on this earth and those who have fixed their focus on Jesus Christ in heaven actually really belong to him. That's going to be his focal point. I have all authority globally of the revised Roman Empire. And I speak as God's spokesperson on earth, right? And I claim that my temple is God's temple and that my authority is God's authority. And that's a frightening thing. But we have people today who have that attitude and have that authority in Rome. In verse 7, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. In verse 8, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name was not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb that had been slain. So he's given power to rule over all the earth. Right? It, this does not mean that he'll directly rule every single nation on earth, but his rule will influence, will, will be so vast and far-reaching that every government on earth will bend to his will. He's going to lead from Rome, and he will oversee every nation on earth, and every nation political leader on earth will bend to his will. And if they don't, they'll be, they'll be destroyed and, and killed. So if he sneezes in Rome, they're going to say, God bless you from New York. Whatever he says, whatever he does, they will do. Because this is the realm of the Antichrist. And because this beast represents a man, resembles a man, but represents a kingdom, he's able to cause thousands to be killed at his command. Give the word, and he'll, he'll annihilate many people, and he will do that. Among those who die will be many believers martyred for Jesus Christ. Um, what we saw that in, the, in, the, in Revelation chapter 7, uh, in the last days of human history, the Antichrist is going to kill a lot of people that are here alive during the tribulation. They'll pay the ultimate price for opposing the leader of the revived Roman Empire. And we're told in Scripture that all who dwell on earth will worship him. And this is really important because we know already that many people are going to get saved during the Great Tribulation time. And that their life, they're going to have to pay for it with their own blood. They're going to be beheaded and killed and they're going to die. But they'll go up under the altar in heaven waiting for God to release them. So many people are going to get saved. But what he means here is that those who dwell on the earth will worship him. Those who love the world. The implication is those who are living for this world, those who are living for materialism or humanists, those have, that have no use for the things of Christ, those that have no use for heavenly things or desire not to become a citizen of heaven, those who are kind of living the good life here on planet earth and they don't want anything else they will worship him because he will be their father figure he brought them out of chaos and into peace but it's a false peace so he he, he reigns in, in that way and look at verse 8 again 
towards the end, um, the, he says, all who worship him, at, the earth will worship him. Those whose names are not been written from the foundation of the world and the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. He says of the lamb who has been slain. This is a picture of the eternal dimension of the cross of Jesus Christ. This statement right here confirms again that time is not a factor in eternity. That the cross was real, that Jesus died on it to pay for the sins of all humanity. And that what he accomplished on the cross, that finished work on the cross, is what allows us to be free in Christ today. To not be under the bondage of sin and its guilt and its shame. So John's reminded of that as he's watching this antichrist kingdom represented by a man come into power and play his 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 game towards eternal destruction of, of people so so what we see here is the death of jesus christ the lamb of god that took place on earth was given a specific date on the calendar yet it's reckoned here as an eternal event he says the lamb who has been slain he's saying there was a time when the lamb was slain for the, from the foundation of the earth. So he gives it a time frame. So the death of Jesus Christ is an event that can be fixed at a particular set of coordinates in space and time, yet at the same time, it's the summit of God's eternal program and it utterly transcends both space and time. So thus the cross of Jesus Christ casts its shadow over all of creation. Never forget that, you who are a believer today. When you stumble in sin or you know someone else that does, when you just don't get it right, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross is greater than any fault in your life. It's greater than any stumbling it's even greater than any transgression. Do you get that? You know, sin is a, is a term that is an archery term. means missing the mark. It means you picked up your bow and your arrow, and you were one of the best shots on the earth. And you aim that bow and that arrow right at the bullseye, and you know you're going to hit it. So you let that arrow go, and phew, it goes, and it misses the target completely. And you're more shocked than anybody else. There's no way I could miss that target. Never in my life would I miss that target. That's what sin is. You've missed the mark. You'll never hit the mark. And Jesus came to take our sin away. But he also came to wash away our transgression. You know what transgression is? Transgression is you pick up the bow. You're the best archer in the world. You aim it at the target, and you go, ah, forget that. Phew! Ha! I missed. Yeah, you did it on purpose. That's transgression. He's come to eternally wash your transgressions away. How is that humanly possible? It's not. It's divinely possible. It's what happened when God became flesh and decided to lay his life down for the sin of all mankind. To wash away my sin and its shame upon my life. And even to wash clean all my transgression for all of eternity. The finished work of Christ can be set and found at a specific date and time in history. Yet, it's absolutely eternal and never ending. Of what he accomplished. That's what he's showing here. Those everyone's name has not been written from the foundation of the world. We just started the book of Genesis on Wednesdays. And we've been looking at the foundations of the world in a very powerful way. And you know something? When, when God laid down the foundations of the world, guess what he hadn't created yet? You and I hadn't created man. And yet he says right here, whose name was not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life. 
God's saying, you trust my son for your salvation? Yes, I do, Lord. Then you trust him and don't fear anything. Walk with me. Trust me. I'm here to see you through this. I laid my life down, not so you could become religious, so you could follow my son and trust in my son. Anybody here know somebody really religious? Many of us, right? They're so religious, it's not even funny. And yet that religion can never, ever, ever save them, ever. It's faith in Christ alone where salvation is offered. And, and he shows that in a strong way. So what we have here when in verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who had been slain. And he says, if anyone, is, if anyone has ears, let him hear. If anyone's destined for captivity, captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, he must be killed uh, with the sword. And here's the perseverance and the faith of the saints. So the picture that we have here is really the picture of an unholy trinity. We have this picture representing the father, um, the first beast. The second beast represents the son, uh, and, and the dragon here represents the Holy Spirit. And, and, and very strongly and, and I guess warmly, um, we're told to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. And that's really important uh, in the day and age we live in today as we get into the rest of this chapter. Um, Verses 9 and 10 kind of read this way. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone leads others into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for the patient, enduring, and faithfulness on the part of the saints. These words have very sharp meaning uh, to them. They're words of encouragement to the believers in the last days. They're words of encouragement to those that are going to follow Christ during that tribulation time. It's as if God were saying, listen, to you and I who are alive today and to those who will be alive at the time during that great tribulation, God is saying, listen, my judgment is coming very soon. And those who have persecuted you will receive the consequences of their sin. Don't let injustice and the slaughter of what's happening in these days hold you back from walking by faith in me. I don't, I don't imagine that any of us could raise our hand to say we have been wholly persecuted our whole Christian life. Anybody say that? And yet during the tribulation time, these people will be horribly persecuted their whole Christian life. Because the church will be removed and they're going to have to face the world's satanic persecution without the leading of the Holy Spirit. Right now, you and I have the leading of the Holy Spirit in God's word. We can be cold to it and do as we please, or we can stop and listen to him and get direction for our life from him. And they're not going to have that at that time. So he's saying this calls for the patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints in a, in a very strong way. Uh, what's going to happen during this time, you're going to have to hang in there and endure. He's saying, for my sake, you've got to keep your faith. Hold on to it. God will not forget any injustice committed against his children. And God will not be mocked. You know when someone mocks God's children, who are they mocking? They're mocking him. And God says in his word, he will not be mocked. Even though it may look like in your eyes that evil's triumphed, it is not because God's judgment is on the way and no one will stop it. That's a guarantee. That's a promise. When we get to verse 11, you have the second beast. This is when a man becomes a beast. So we've looked at a kingdom and how it's going to spread across the whole earth. It's going to become a global authority and power and persecute the saints. That's what it's going to do, the believers. Now you have this one 
uh, the second beast. Verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beasts, and that in his presence he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to, to earth, to the earth, in the presence of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the science which was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small, the great, the rich, and the poor, and the free men, and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here in his wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So you have the second beast steps up. And this beast is a, is a man who becomes a beast. And it says in verse 11, he comes up out of the earth, uh, he, he, which means he's of the world, and he has two horns like a lamb, and he speaks like a dragon. I've been to many zoos in my life. I, do you ever see a lamb with horns? I've seen goats with horns. I've never seen a lamb with a horn. And he says a lamb with two horns like a lamb. And, and, and he speaks like a dragon. So lambs don't have horns. The horn symbolizes power. And the speaking like a dragon shows that he's a dangerous fraud. This antichrist, this false prophet, you might want to call him, is a dragon in sheep's clothing. He is the religious leader of the earth. The political entity is going to unite the world globally. And what this guy does is he comes in and he unites all religions globally. He's going to be clothed as a saint, I guess you could say, a great, great religious leader. This is the Antichrist. He's the one who will claim to be Christ to all the religions of the world. He will come in the power of a priest and the power of a prophet, usurping the role of Jesus Christ. You know what's frightening? That's what the word vicar means. You know anybody who holds that title? The word vicar as far as Webster's Dictionary goes in 1828, a person authorized to perform the functions of another, a substitute in office. There's only one man on earth who claims to be the vicar of Jesus Christ on earth. And he's in Rome right now. So like Jesus Christ, just like Jesus Christ, is our high priest leading us towards the true worship of the Father, this Antichrist will lead the world towards the worship of the first beast. Turn and worship this global kingdom. Turn and worship the first beast. So the worship is not pointed to the Father, it's pointed to the world. Come and worship this first beast. And it's a very frightening one. Um, in that. Again, another picture of the, this false holy trinity. In, in verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to breathe to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So what we have here is, and even Jesus warned us about a false prophet and all his lying signs and wonders. This 
false prophet will play with fire until he's cast into the lake of fire and the world will be taken captive by his deception. If you've read Genesis at all, how easily did Satan deceive Eve? We're going to look at that Wednesday night very strongly. God created Adam, and from Adam, God formed Eve. That means he took from Adam something and formed it into Eve. And then he brought her to Adam... And Adam said, this is one. This one completes me. This one belongs to me. This one is of me. Like, I'm missing something, Lord. And you brought her into my life. She has a sensitivity I don't have to certain things. She has a compassion I don't have to certain things. She sees things a whole lot different than I do. Yeah, this one I need in my life right now to walk this life whole, secure, solid. So when Satan came to Eve, he knew not to go to Adam. He took her sensitivity, her compassion, and he came in and he deceived her. Just like that. And you know what? This false prophet will take captive the world by his deception in a very powerful way he will seduce the world into the worship of the first beast he acts as a channel i'm a channel for god's miraculous power he's going to speak as if he has authority to speak from god he's going to imitate the miracles of god and by his blasphemous demonstration of satanic power he fools the world into thinking he is god And a frightening thing. And it's because of this demonstration or deceptive demonstration that the Antichrist will end up giving permission to the Jewish nation to rebuild their temple. He's going to perform a tremendous, what the world would call a miracle. And it's going to encourage the Jews to rebuild their temple. And we're almost to that plane right now on earth. We're ready for it. His authority and his character are from Satan. His throne of power over the world is Rome, and his ancestral background is Jewish. He makes an image of the first beast, and he gives it breath. He makes it speak. That means the world is so inspired and in awe at this presentation that he gives that the world will rush in and run to worship him and their obedience to him. And yet, he'll still demand it over them. That's an amazing thing. Do you ever train a dog? Anybody ever really train a dog? When you beat a dog senseless, are they openly, willingly obedient to you? Or if you give them the freedom to learn, they become filled with joy at obedience to you. The Antichrist, the people, because of what they see in this image of the beast uh, breathing and speaking and talking, they rush to worship this false prophet and their obedience they offer to him, but he demands it over them. And that's the difference there, and it's really frightening. Um, So what you see happening here, look at verse uh, 16. Um, He causes all, the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the freemen, the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or or the number of his name. So uh, here is wisdom. Let him understand and calculate the number of the beast for the number of It is the number of a man, his number is 666. So you have this false prophet, he gives this image of the beast life, and it shocks everybody, and they look at him as God, and they rush to him to offer him their worship and obedience, which he then demands over them. And and what's happening here is there's a uniting of religion and politics, almost like business business. He takes the world globally, politically, and he takes the world globally, religiously, and he unites it with business. 
No one can buy or sell unless allegiance to me. In fact, you can't do anything unless your allegiance is to me. And he makes this global pact. And really, that's what's happening. If you want to do business, if you want to live your life in any way, shape, or form, you need to have the mark of the beast. And, and what's amazing is, you know, don't get online and look up the mark of the beast. There is so much garbage out there, it's not even funny. What God wanted us to know about the mark of the beast is right here in five sentences. Hold on to that and don't follow things. You know, we're, we're, we're not told about what the mark of the beast is, only what will happen to those who have it and those who don't. But that never stops the world today because there's so many expositors online trying to tell us what it is. Don't follow blind superstitions that proclaim Bible prophecy when God has not said something. We're all told here, here is wisdom. Let him who has wisdom calculate the number. It is the number of a man is number 666. Don't add to that. Don't take away from that. Why? Because we've been given what's for us. And they will be given what's for them. And that time is coming very, very quick. What you have with the mark, it's really, it's a cruel exercise of power. It's usurping authority over men. Every moment of our life today, every moment of our life, God has given you and I the free choice to worship him. Has he not? He has given you the free choice. He's never demanded obedience from anyone in this room. He's never demanded worship of anyone in this room. He's laid out a free choice. It is your free choice to love me, to worship me, to be obedient to my word, to trust me. Yet the Antichrist will use his authority to control and enforce men to worship and obey him. There's a huge difference in those two pictures, in that. The beast will kill as many people as he can, and again, he's going to cause all, that's both great, small, rich, poor, to receive this mark on their right hand or their forehead. No one will be able to live their lives freely and any more from that. So the world will have to succumb to this mark in order to buy or sell. They won't be able to do anything unless they have the mark on them. Now we're told the number is 666. Again, I just suggest don't waste your time or waste God's precious time in your life um, that he's given you to try to figure out this number or try to identify some person by this number. That's not why it's given to us. We should be uh, presenting to people Jesus Christ so they don't have to go through this great tribulation period. Our commission is to bring the good news of God's love to a lost and dying world. And I can't tell you how many people I hear that are trying to figure out 666 and who the person is and what he is. We just take what God says. And, and lay it out there. But bring people to Christ where they can come to him and trust in him. And you know what? If he wants them to know something, he'll show them. But lay out the facts. I think that's why when you have a verse-by-verse -verse teaching of the word of God, not many people enjoy it. It would be a whole lot more enjoyable if I get up here and spent 45 minutes just talking about the mark of the beast and AI and the microchip and get your all tantalated. Oh, that's probably what it is. And you could all go home and say, that's probably what it is. Pastor Ron said so. No, you're going to hear just what the word of God says. This is what it is. This is what he wants us to know. Why? Because people will take the mark and go to hell for eternity. People you know. And God is saying, enough worrying about your sin. It's washed away. Go share my love with people. Go offer the hope that I offer you. To be made whole. To be made clean. 
Time is short. Time is so short. Don't play games with that time. Share my hope, share my love, share my good news with others. So again, the number is for them. They're going to face the horrific and terrible time. They're going to figure it out and, and that they might then look to Jesus Christ and trust in him as they face their death. The one thing for sure about this number, it's a mark of authority. That means when push comes to shove during that great tribulation time, you will have one choice and it won't be forced on you. And the choice will be you either will be required to say the beast is Lord or Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. That's what it's going to come down to. You will either stand before and say this is false messiah whatever his name's going to be is lord and i trust him give me the mark whatever it is i will i identify with him or you will lose your life and say i stand here and i identify with jesus christ people told me the gospel i've heard it from the 144,000 even the angels are shouting it out in the sky i am trusting jesus christ as the lord of my life off with your head and that's how it's going to be and it's a frightening thing but but that's what people at that time are going to have to face there will be no middle ground you will either identify with the beast or you'll identify with christ much more greater would be to face the trial of what this world throws at us by identifying with christ now And God is saying, share with people so that they do that. And never forget this, that the first beast represents a kingdom. So never put your faith and trust in any kingdom of the earth. And the second beast represents a man. So never put your faith and trust in any man on this earth. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Get that? Out of anything we read in in this chapter 13, because it's expressed through time, it's one thing for sure. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, not in some kingdom, nor in some man. You know, pretty soon we're going to have a presidential election, and people are so tossed in, in America by that today. Never put your faith and trust in a man. I don't care if he's governing our nation. Pray for him. Pray for him. But you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because he's who you will spend eternity with, and that's a guarantee. So what John does in chapter 13 is he's encouraging those of us, I guess today, um, who suffer under persecution and oppression to just endure faithfully. Don't give up. It's so much easier to give up, isn't it? We're under pressure. It's just so much easier to give up and walk away. And God's saying, don't give up. If you think it's bad right now in your life, you think about what they're going to face at this time. You're not facing the mark of a beast. You're not facing the death and the beheading of your life because of your faith in Christ. But they will face that. So endure faithfully. What? Knowing that God is sovereign, that he will not allow injustice to win in the end, that sooner or later the human instruments of Satan's plan uh, will hang themselves, just like Judas did. It's going to happen. The Antichrist, in his attempt to control the world and destroy God's people, his ability to influence the governments of the world to become cruel and barbaric, is going to fall utterly short. Though he will kill a lot of people. But guess who wins in the end? God does. And guess whose side we're on? Amen. Amen. I used to say that all the time. Did you ever watch Rocky? He just gets get up. You, you, in the end, you win. Just get up. There ain't going to be a rematch. There's going to be a rematch and you win. It's written in the script. Oh, I was beaten down again. Get back up. Yeah, but my face is all deformed and my body hurts and I'm bleeding. Get up. Because in the end, we win. 
And we're here to encourage one another. To what? To get up and press on. No matter what it takes. To never give up, no matter what. These governments of the world that Satan is overseeing and he's doing 99% of them today. They'll use violence, torture, intimidation to maintain control. You know what that means? They're going to use fear, guilt, and shame to control the masses. And guess what? Jesus Christ has washed away from us for all of eternity. Fear, guilt, and shame. I have no guilt. If I stumble in sin, I get back up. I'm sorry, Lord. I blew it. You know me. Let's go forward in this. And God says, I I don't see anything. It's hard for me to grasp that. But it's the truth of his word. And fear, I don't fear tomorrow. My heart could stop beating any time right now. I don't fear tomorrow. If my heart stops beating, you might freak out. But guess what? I won't. Guess where I'll wake up? In his arms. Are you serious? That was, that's the joy of my life. To wake up in his arms for all of eternity. That would be a blessing. It would be a little weird right now if it happened. But, uh, but fear, guilt, and shame. The guilt. Don't let fear, guilt, and shame beat you down. Jesus has washed that away from you for all of eternity. If you face fear, guilt, and shame, if you're a guy, grab another guy in this church and ask for prayer. If you're a gal, grab a gal. Say, you know, the word I heard, but I'm, I'm wrestling with fear. Okay. Everybody understand what it means to wrestle with fear? Everybody understand what it means to wrestle with guilt, to wrestle with shame? No one's new to it. We all know it. We also know how the blood of Christ washes us. So we get back up, we press on, and we don't give up. We encourage one another all the way in what we're called to do. So again, when we started this book of Revelation, I tried to make it real clear that this book was given to us to encourage us in our faith in Christ. Not to get us to seek after who the Antichrist is or what the number means or when this is going to happen or when that's going to happen. No, to encourage our faith in Christ today. Why? Because we need it in today's day and age. We need the encouragement to press on trusting him when, when sometimes it doesn't seem like it's going to go the, our way in that. It's never giving up. So that's chapter 13. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to spend in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would take your word that was taught today. Let it be planted deep in every heart. Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit so the enemy could not steal it away. And let it accomplish your purpose, no matter what that is. In every heart, Lord, you've set it out for a reason and you say in your word it would never return to you void. Let it bear fruit for your glory. Let it accomplish all that you want done. Lord, we thank you for this time. We trust you. And we ask that you lead us in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.